Good evening. My name is Ian St. John, and it gives me much pleasure today to welcome you to the twelfth in our series of St. John's Pipecasts. Our topic for today is the causes of the German hyperinflation of the years 1919 to 1923. Now the term inflation simply refers to a sustained rise in the general level of prices. And hyperinflation simply means a very rapid rate of inflation. A rate so rapid that it tends to destroy the three key functions of money as a store of value, a means of exchange, and as a measure of value. And in effect thereby renders the currency useless. There have been many hyperinflations in history but none so notorious, dramatic or portentous in political consequences as the German hyperinflation which began in 1919 and ended in 1923 with the total destruction of the mark as a currency. The images and stories associated with this inflation are infamous of workers being paid in whole suitcases stuffed full of paper money, of children using bundles of notes as playthings, of people selling a house one day and being able to buy only a box of matches with the proceeds the next. At the height of the inflationary process the figures involved become so large as to be almost meaningless. Between June and November 1923, prices rose by 800 billion percent. Now the absolute price level cannot be shown on a graph unless it were traced on a vast sheet of paper. But diagram 1 gives some idea of the rate of increase on the logarithmic scale. By mid-November 1923, a single American dollar could have bought you 1,000 billion marks. One statistic, I think, captures the extent of the collapse of the mark's value better than any other. Namely, it would have required the entire stock of the German money supply of 1913 to have purchased one single box of matches in 1923. The facts of the hyperinflation are clear enough, but why did it happen? How was it that a respected European currency was reduced by 1923 to the value of, in the words of F.D. Graham, something more ridiculous than zero? In one sense, German hyperinflation is easy to explain occurred because there was a dramatic growth in the supply of notes, coins and bank money in Germany, a growth which far exceeded the capacity of the economy to meet the resulting monetary demand with an increase in the physical output of goods. There was in Germany from 1914 an ever widening mismatch between the level of money demand in the economy and the supply of goods and services to meet it. And, as is generally known, when too much money chases too few goods, then the result is inflation. This relationship between money, goods and the price level can be expressed formally through the quantity theory of money, which, in the form developed by Irving Fisher, states that MV equals PT. The left hand side of this equation gives the total money demand for goods and services. It is calculated by multiplying the amount of cash currency and bank deposits in the economy M by the average number of times each unit of money is used in a given period, the velocity of circulation or V. The right hand side represents the total value of transactions in a given period of time. 
which is equal to the number of transactions in a given period, T, multiplied by the average price per transaction, P. Now MV and PT are always equal, as they really are, in effect, different ways of measuring the same thing the total monetary value of transactions in an economy in a given period. In essence, the value of output. Since the total number of transactions of goods and services is the same thing as the real output of goods and services, we can think of T as the real GDP or output of the economy, often expressed as Y. In other words, MV equals PY or the price level P equals MV divided by the total level of output Y. Now Fisher believed that the velocity of circulation V is constant over a reasonable space of time, being determined by such factors as the efficiency of the banking system, the frequency with which people are paid, the speed of communications and so on. Similarly, the level of real output Y is assumed fixed by the full employment output of the economy as determined by real factors, the labour supply, the quantity of raw materials, level of technology and so on. Now with V and Y thus fixed, it follows that if the stock of money M increases, then the average level of prices P must also rise. The direction of causality runs from M to P, from money to prices. Even if we assume more realistically that real output, or Y, is not fixed in the short run, if the rate of growth of M and V exceeds the rate of growth of real output, then the price level P will rise. Inflation will occur. This is what happened in Germany from 1914 as the growth in the money supply outstripped the growth of output and inflation was the result. Now there were two aspects to this. First, the rate of growth in the effective money demand due to the growth of M and V. And second, the fall or slow growth of Y. These two trends combine to yield an ever more pronounced rise in the price level, though of the two, the increase in the circulating medium was by far the most important. But let's take first the real output of the economy. The growth of the real output of the German economy was hindered by the war and post-war developments. The war itself caused a reduction in goods to purchase in the shops, as output was diverted to munitions, and a blockade was imposed by the Allies, cutting off access to foreign supplies. Germany, of course, lost well over a million men in the war, while the Treaty of Versailles saw Germany lose about one-eighth of its land area. In 1923, the German economy sustained a further blow when French and Belgian forces occupied the Ruhr to extract reparations in kind, provoking a wave of strikes and industrial sabotage. Thus, by 1920, German industrial output was only 64% of its 1913 level, and by 1924, it was still only 82%. Such supply-side limitations would have added to inflationary pressure, even with uh, a constant supply of money. But a reduction of output compared to pre-war levels of about a fifth cannot, cannot account obviously for inflation rates in the millions of percent. For this, an increase in either the money supply or the velocity of circulation was required, and Germany experienced both. Table 1 shows the growth in money supply and the price level between 1914 and late November 1923. As could be seen, during the war years 1914-18, to 18, the total money supply increased by a factor of 
and the price level doubled. Between January 1919 and January 1922, it grew by a further 3.6 times. The real acceleration, however, began in the second half of 1922. Between July and December of that year, the total money supply grew by over 500% and prices increased by 1,375%. During 1923, both the nominal money supply and the price level quite simply exploded. The money supply grew by a factor of 739 million and the price level by a factor of 511 million. As money lost its value, people began to spend any money received faster and faster. The mark lost its function as a store of value hence the velocity of circulation rose. In March 1922 it was double the 1913 level. By July 1923 it was 10 times and by October 1923 it was 17 times the rate of 1913. This acceleration in the speed of usage of money only compounded the rapid growth in the stock of money, with the result that effective money demand, M multiplied by V, increased at ever more dramatic rates from the second half of 1922, and, as the quantity theory predicts, when the growth in money demand so outstrips the growth in physical output, the result is very rapid inflation. Equally, on the 15th of November 1923, when a new renter mark currency fixed in supply was introduced, the hyperinflationary process ended almost overnight. Thus, as we remarked, the mechanics of German hyperinflation are not too hard to explain. More and more money was being produced, and this money circulated faster and faster, with the consequence that prices rose ever more rapidly. The real question is, why did this happen? Why did Germany experience the total ruination of its currency? The basic factor driving the increase in the money supply was the persistent tendency of the German government to spend more than it received in income from 1914 onwards. Now during wartime, all combatant states ran budget deficits and increased the money supply and they all experienced inflation. By the end of the war Germany's price level was double what it had been in 1914 but this was not an especially rapid rise. Britain's prices also doubled. Those of France had trebled and those of Italy quadrupled. The difference was that where other countries reined in their budget deficits after the war, the German government continued to spend more than it received in its tax revenue. As a result, the government finances were always in deficit throughout the period 1919 to 1923, as Table 2 shows. The point was that the new Weimar government established in the wake of the loss of the war and the overthrow of the Kaiser, faced considerable pressures to spend money, yet lacked the political authority to raise taxes to pay for it. The economy was in a desperate condition, and the centre-left government was unwilling to tax the working class, and faced much resistance from the wealthier classes when any attempt was made to make the rich pay higher taxes. The Minister of Finance, Erzberger, who drew up plans for tax reforms, was already hated by the right because he signed the armistice to settle the war in 1918, and he was then shot dead in the Black Forest in 1921. Caught between these forces, the Weimar government adopted, reasonably enough, the expedient of simply running a deficit.
and borrowing the funds to pay for it. And here we come to the engine of the inflationary process. To raise the necessary revenue, the state treasury issued three month treasury bills. These were interest bearing certificates which the state sold and then promised to buy back at their face value at the end of the three month period. Now treasury bills were and remain a well established way for governments to raise revenue from the capital market. The problem was that the volume of treasury bills being issued by the German government was far more than the financial markets could absorb. And as a result, the German Reichsbank, their central bank, stepped in to purchase the unsold bills. And how did it pay for these bills? Well, quite simply, by printing money. This money was then received by the government, which used it to fund its spending. In this way, the issuing of treasury bills resulted in the expansion of the German money supply, and this in turn led to inflation. Table 3 shows the relentless rise of central bank purchase of treasury bills from 1914 onwards. In 1920, 60% of government spending was being covered by the issue of treasury bills. And by January 1922, 50% of treasury bills were being bought by the central bank by printing money. By December 1922, this figure was 79%. The result was inflation. And this only made the government's entire position worse. Because as inflation accelerated, the real value of whatever government money did receive through taxation obviously fell. And as a result, the government was less and less able to pay its way through, tax through taxes and came to light almost exclusively upon the issuing of treasury bills and thus the printing of money. By October 1923, 98% of all German government spending was being paid for out of the issue of treasury bills. In essence, the government was using printing money and inflation as a substitute for taxation. By printing money, the government gained access to goods and services, but in so doing so, the expanded money supply led to inflation, which reduced the real value of the population's incomes, just as a tax would have done. Now, as prices rose and workers pushed for higher wages, the value of the state's spending fell. So it had to print more money and so initiate a further surge in inflation. Printing money and inflation became a kind of drug to which the government was increasingly addicted to fund its operations. But like most drugs, it only worked with higher and higher doses requiring more and more printing of money and thereby higher and higher rates of inflation. Now the government did not intend for this to happen. It did not deliberately engineer a high for inflation. It simply needed to pay its way without recourse to regular taxation. But the effect of issuing more treasury bills and printing more money was to cause ever faster inflation. And inflation had, in the short term, another benefit to the state. It ate up the real value of the government's high national debt. Now, like most countries, Germany emerged from the war with a large national debt, and post-war borrowing only, of course, added to it. By October 1920, the debt stood at the equivalent in British pounds at 14.4 billion. But inflation meant the real value of the debt contracted rapidly. By November 1923, when the nominal value of the German national debt was measured in quintillions of marks, its value in dollars was just 50 million. The national debt of Germany had in effect been inflated away. Thus, the German inflation was caused by an excessively large 
note issue by the Reichsbank, which was called upon to print money to purchase the ever greater numbers of treasury bills being issued by the government because it was unable or unwilling to fund its expenditure out of regular taxation. This was the core narrative of 1919 to 1923. Yet it was not the only narrative, and it was not the story the Germans themselves told about what was happening to them. And to this we now turn. Now if you had asked a German in the early 20s what was the cause of hyperinflation, they would probably have answered that it was caused by the fall in the external value of the German mark. And this fall was precipitous indeed. In 1914 there was a little over four German marks to a dollar. By February 1920 there were a hundred and by November 1923 there were about four trillion. At which point a German with 42 billion marks could purchase one American cent. Now this fall in the external value of the mark contributed to inflation two ways. First, it raised the cost of imported goods into Germany. When a country, say America, sold a product to Germany, then the American manufacturer had to convert the dollar price of the good, as made in Germany, into German marks for selling on the German market. And this it would do at the prevailing exchange rate. So, as the exchange rate fell, the mark price of an American product rose. In other words, the more marks there were to a dollar, so for example, if a shirt cost one dollar to make and sold in America for one dollar, and when the exchange rate was one dollar, say, to four marks, then an American shirt of one dollar would sell for four marks in Germany. Of course, as the, as the value of the German mark fell, perhaps to 50 marks to a dollar, 100 marks to a dollar, so a shirt costing one pound will begin to cost 50, uh, 50 marks or 100 marks. So as the exchange rate declined, so the domestic price of American imported goods rose. Thus, between October 1918 and January 1920, the mark lost 90% of its value against the dollar, and the price of imported goods rose 12-fold. Diagram 2 shows how the fall in the external value of the mark tracked the rise in the price of imported goods. Second, Germans saw the fall in the value of their currency and expected it to cause inflation. So they responded by charging higher prices if they were producers or demanding higher wages if they were workers. The result was the very inflation they had expected. Quite simply, the external value of the mark was the most tangible indicator in Germany of the actual rate of inflation. And as it fell, so did inflation become part of Germany's expectations, and hence a reality. So then we face the question, why was the mark losing value? Now there are two main structural factors behind this. First was the German balance of payments deficit. Now through the war, Germany's imports of goods and services exceeded its exports by a total of about 15 billion gold marks. This balance of payments deficit continued after the war. Between 1919 and 1922, the total deficit was 11 billion gold marks. Now such a deficit meant Germany was supplying more marks to buy a foreign currency than foreign countries were seeking marks to buy German goods, and the result was a fall in the exchange rate. The balance of payments deficit was thus one cause of inflation, but it was not the most important. For most of the period 1922-23, the German balance of payments was actually in balance. It was precisely in this period 
that the country's currency collapsed the fastest. Further, whilst rising input prices do raise the price level, it will not in itself cause sustained inflation, unless the money supply increases to accommodate it. If it does not, the imported goods will simply become relatively more expensive, and people will switch to homemade goods and the price rise will be choked off. If the price of an American made shirt goes from four dollars to one hundred so it goes from four marks to one hundred marks and then a thousand marks, people simply stop buying American shirts. What allowed the price of all goods to rise, foreign and German, was that German consumers were awash with money to pay for them. The second factor behind the depreciation of the mark was reparations. Now, as a result of losing the war, Germany had to pay the victorious Allies 132 billion gold marks. These payments were to begin in 1921 with an initial cash payment of 1 billion gold marks, followed by annual payments of 2 billion gold marks thereafter. Now the initial payment of 1 billion gold marks was made, but after this the Germans began to default and the last cash payment the Germans made was in July 1922. Now these reparation payments contribute to inflation in two ways. Now first, as I said reparations had been made in gold marks or in a strong foreign currency like the dollar. But of course Germany didn't possess a sufficient supply of either to pay such sums and had to purchase foreign currency with marks on the international money market. Now this fueled inflation in two ways. First, the increase in the supply of marks on the currency market drove down the exchange value of the mark raising import prices, as we've seen. And second, to raise the cash to pay for this currency, the government had to issue yet more treasury bills, and effectively to print it, which of course raised the money supply again. Thus, reparations did worsen Germany's inflationary problem, and many Germans saw it as the main cause. Yet it was not really the main factor at work here. The mark was losing value before reparations began in 1921, and it did so far more once reparations stopped being paid in mid-1922. Equally, of the total increase in Germany's short-term debt between 1920 and 1923, about a third was due to costs imposed by the Allies. The greater part was due to government financial policy. But secondly, reparations exerted a more dramatic impact in January 1923. Now because Germany had stopped paying reparations, the French and Belgian armies decided to invade the Ruhr to extract reparations by force. Now the Ruhr was Germany's most important economic region. It accounted for example for 85% of its coal production and 80% of its steel and iron production. Multiple forces now converged to destroy the German currency. First, government's tax revenues fell even further as the economy of the Ruhr ground to a halt under passive resistance to the occupation and the loss of revenues from taxes on coal and exports. Second, Germany's foreign exchange earnings fell, as the French and, Ger uh, French and Belgians helped themselves to the output of coal and iron, so those goods weren't being exported and they weren't generating any foreign currency demand. Third, the state, to support firms and workers who were resisting the French, gave them subsidies, which of course were funded by printing money. The total money supply increased fivefold between the beginning of January and the end of April 1923. 
By the end of April 1923, 75% of all Treasury bills being issued were being bought by the Reichsbank by printing money. And in September of 1923, five-eighths of the money being raised through the sale of Treasury bills was being used to fund the passive resistance in the Ruhr. Lastly, the entry of French and Belgian forces into the Ruhr precipitated a further loss of confidence in the German economy and hence the German mark people began to sell the mark in favour of foreign currencies. Much of this selling, indeed, was done by the Germans themselves. At the beginning of January 1923, there were 6,890 marks to a dollar. By the end of January, there were 49,000. And by the end of June, there were 193,500 marks to the dollar. Clearly, the reoccupation was a major factor in the hyperinflation story. Germans especially, of course, blamed it for their woes. And it fitted a narrative according to which hyperinflation was a trauma imposed on Germany by the Allies and their huge and unjust reparation demands. But we cannot elevate it to the foremost factor in our explanation. Rapid inflation preceded the Ruhr occupation, and, as Bresciani Tironi points out, it wasn't the Ruhr occupation itself that caused accelerated inflation, it was the government's response to it, which was to unleash yet another wave of government spending by printing money, so making a further surge in inflation inevitable. Now the basic question confronting anyone who reflects upon the causes of German hyperinflation is this. Why did the German government and its central bank persist in printing more and more and ultimately obscenely large quantities of money when it seemed so apparently obvious that in doing so they were merely fueling the fire of a catastrophic inflation? Now the answer to this question takes us to mentalities. Germany's financiers and bankers just did not accept the quantity theory of money model of inflation prevalent in the Anglo-Saxon world, the, the, the Fisher equation we considered earlier. They did not see a causal relationship between printing money, inflation and the depreciation of the mark. If anything, the causality they believed was the opposite. It was the balance of payments deficit and the consequent rise in the price of goods that caused the increase in the money supply. This was a theory of Karl Hellerich, who had been Secretary of State for Finance during the war, who wrote in his popular textbook on money, and I quote, The depreciation of the German mark in terms of foreign currencies was caused by the excessive burdens thrust onto Germany and by the policy of violence adopted by France. The increase of the prices of all imported goods was caused by the depreciation of the exchanges. Then followed the general increase of internal prices and of wages. The increased need for means of circulation on the part of the public and of the state. Greater demands on the Reichsbank by private business and the state and the increase of the paper mark issues. Contrary to the widely held conception, not inflation, but the depreciation of the mark was the beginning of this chain of cause and effect. Inflation of the currency is not the cause of the increase of prices and of the depreciation of the mark, but the depreciation of the mark is the cause of the increase of prices and of the paper mark issues. Even more alarmingly, perhaps, it was the theory of Rudolf Havenstein, the president of the Reichsbank. Far from seeing it as the central bank's role to limit the increase of the money supply to slow inflation, he regarded it as the bank's role to print more and more money to feed the growing demand for cash as prices rose. The Reichsbank believed that if it did not increase the money supply, the economy would crash and the result would be unemployment and social unrest. To stop this, it resolved to print however much money seemed to be required. 
hence it bought whatever treasury bills the state issued it also printed money to buy any commercial bills issued by private firms quite simply by the late summer of 1923 the central bank was printing as much money as it physically could on the 25th of October it boasted that it had printed money worth 120,000 million million marks in one day using 2,000 printing presses adding that its aim was to print half a quintillion marks by the end of the week in fact to speed up the production of money it began to only print on one side of the notes to say it to speed up the printing process it also began to issue notes of extraordinary face value including a two trillion value mark the Reichsbank really then to be honest with you was like a dog chasing its own tail the faster it ran the printing presses the quicker the goal of ever supplying enough money receded over the horizon there really was no solution but for the hyperinflation to burn itself out this happened on the 15th of November 1923 when the decision was taken to create a new currency the Rentenmark with one Rentenmark being set equal in value to one trillion of the old marks and to fix its supply abandoning the old Reichsmark to its fate the fever of hyperinflation ended with this decision and ironically or not Paul Havenstein died five days later to summarise the essential cause of the German inflation was the excessive issue of paper money if we ask why so much paper money was issued we really have two answers first the government was un unable or unwilling to balance its budget which led it to borrow by issuing treasury bills which the Reichsbank purchased by printing money hence the money supply was continually growing faster than the output of the economy and this of course led to inflation second Germany's financiers bankers and journalists believed that inflation was caused by the depreciation of the external value of the mark itself caused they believed by balance of payments problems and the burden of reparations they saw money as a passive factor which need to increase in supply to ensure that the higher prices could be sustained without that a collapse of Germany's economy threatened the trouble was that by printing money to absurd amounts a different kind of collapse occurred a collapse of savings and of pensions and the functionality of money and ultimately a collapse of trust in the state in the end the hard economic realities of a Germany which had bankrupted itself fighting and losing a war could not be avoided by the device of simply printing money only once the reality was faced by Stresemann and Schacht in late 1923 a monetary discipline was reimposed could some kind of of economic recovery occur in Germany though by then maybe it was already too late thank you